Good evening, um, candidates for House District 10 and uh, everyone in the audience. My name is Marguerite Herman, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's forum for the League of Women Voters. We're doing uh, forums for three legislative districts tonight, House District 10, 12, and 44. In a week on uh, July 17th, we will have two more legislative uh, races covered, Senate uh, District 5 and House District 7, and we chose to put those together because 7 is nested in that, that Senate district, so we'll be, be dealing with about the same constituents. And then just to let people know, at the end of the month, July 31st, we will have a forum for the uh, City Council, all three wards on one night. And then in August, we'll have, uh, at the County Fair, at the um, Frontier Park, we'll have forums for all the county offices, and then for two of the statewide offices, the treasurer and auditor. So it, it's, a, it's a busy couple of months, just to remind people, absentee voting has already started. The primary is August 21st. You can vote by mail. You can vote um, early at the atrium at the county building. And if you want to know anything about registering, voting, county clerk's office has all that information. So we urge you to get in touch with them we will be recording all of our uh, forums, uh, thanks to Charter, and uh, Jacob Hamill is helping us out. And they'll be on YouTube, and we hope that um, the people uh, who uh, support you can, can find something on there that, uh, that they can share with their friends. Um, certainly, it'll be a source of information that we hope you'll use. Um, and uh, just to also, yes, reminder that the primary is August 21st, and people can can find the voting centers on that day or vote early. Um, just to let you know, League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that's open to all, all people. We work to help people get involved in their government to be informed and to vote. And uh, that's the purpose of these forums. So, and we, and sort of to that end, just to let people know, we have a brochure called Choosing a Candidate in Wyoming, and it just helps people with some ways to evaluate candidates in their campaigns. And also a part of that, the Wyoming League of Women Voters has written something called the Principles for Campaign Integrity. And I think all the candidates got a copy of this. And there's a handy brochure with the principles in it. We'll be happy to get those to anybody. They're out on the desk, I mean, the table out there. And um, it's just a tool to help candidates, uh, well, or it helps the voters one more way that they can maybe evaluate the candidates in their campaigns and um, we hope the candidates themselves endorse the principles and observe them as they campaign for the 2018 election. Um, just as the format, a little ground rules, there'll be two minutes to open and you can use them to uh, talk about yourself while you're running for office. You can use those two minutes any way you want. Uh, we have Pat Hayes is our timer. She will give you a sign when you're getting close. Um, when when they when you get down to a stop, you'll know that that your time has expired. And also, I believe the timer will also have a little auto cue, an irritating beep. Um, so after the two minutes to open the questions, you'll have a minute and a half, and then you'll have an option to have you know, 30 more seconds that you can either add something that you want to add or respond to what someone else has said. And uh, we'll, we hope to get through five or six questions. Um, if people want a question from the audience, you think that uh, something has come up that uh, you want to ask these candidates, we have league members with cards and with pencils. And so just raise your hand. They'll bring a card to you, write it down, and bring it up, and we'll try to get to it, do a be the best we can. Please make the questions so that they apply to all three candidates, so not just one candidate questions. Um, and... Um, and then finally, you know, again, um, just uh, we'll uh, we'll have a timer keep you on, keep you on on uh, on track, and uh, and and then two minutes to end. We'll have two minutes to wrap up. Again, to use any way you want as as a final question for it. It should all take about forty five minutes. So, without further ado, I just want to introduce for the viewing audience, and then on YouTube, um, three candidates who are running for House District Ten. The, the uh, Democratic candidate, Jennifer Pasqua, she does not have a, um, an opponent for the primary, so she will be on the general election ballot. But we wanted all the candidates involved in the election to be up here on the dais um, answering the questions. Um, the incumbent, uh, Representative Eklund, and his Republican challenger, Don Edmonds. All right, and if we're 
if you're ready to go, uh, go ahead and start. And uh, we'll start with Jennifer, I guess, and we'll just sort of stagger the beginnings. So you have two minutes. Right. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and all of you for being here. Um, in every election, there is a choice. And I believe that this year that choice could not be clearer. And there's not only a choice between two parties, but also a choice in what we want for Wyoming's future. So if you think about every important moment in history, World War II, landing on the moon, etc., they all involve looking to the future and moving forward. Today, our state legislature is not preparing our K-12 students for the future. They continuously cut millions of dollars funding. We cannot move our citizens forward if our state legislature tells the poorest among us that they don't matter. So how can we prepare them for the future when the Department of Health receives over $100 million in cuts? So what do the citizens in our state do when they try to buy health insurance that is affordable and readily available, but they cannot move forward because legislators keep fighting about past laws? So what do women in our state do if they want to feel like they are part of the conversation? How do they move forward in a state where only 12 women serve in the entire legislature? So how do we move Wyoming forward? Franklin Roosevelt once said, it is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. We need to bring more voices into Wyoming politics. Something is not working, so we must try something. I'm Jennifer Pasqua, candidate for House District 10, and I'm ready to move Wyoming forward. Thank you very much. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Marguerite. I'm John Eklund. I'm the incumbent. I ran first for this office eight years ago. Um, I'm a, res res a lifetime resident of Laramie County. I farm and ranch northeast of here, about 30 miles. My uh, um, wife and I have three daughters and one of them is in business with us and she and her husband and family are on the farm with us and our oldest daughter is in Goshen County. Our youngest daughter is in Laramie. Um, I have a lot of interest in the state of Wyoming to see that it, it remains a, a, a viable and good place to live and it uh, has certainly served, served well for my family for over a hundred years and I um, I would humbly ask for another couple of years. There's a few things that I, I feel are unfinished, and uh, I would like a bit more time to, to try to get some of the loose ends finished up that, from my perspective, need to be done for the state of Wyoming. Um, I realize we have a lot of challenges in the state, the boom-bust economy that seems to plague us about every ten, eight, eight to ten years, would it be nice to take that thing on and uh, look at some alternative um, taxing and revenue streams. Uh, right now we just do not have the revenue that's keeping up with the, the expenses of the state. Uh, but I would, I would like to have a couple more years to work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Edmonds, two minutes. Yes, my name is Don Edmonds. I am uh, a fourth generation Wyoming white. I lived in the eastern part of Laramie County for a number of years until my parents moved to uh, just outside Cheyenne. And I've lived, bought the house that my dad lived in, so I've lived in the same place since 1956. I've got a pretty good understanding on what's going on in our state. I have a son, Seth Edmonds, who is uh, graduated from Emory which is a very prestigious medical college. I have a daughter that's graduated from the uh, Denver Metro, and she's a major artist. And unfortunately, neither of those children will ever want to move back to the state of Wyoming. And I think that's terrible. I agree that, you know, that uh, we have to do something to be able to keep this brain drain that we have of our youth going out of the state. And the thing about it, what I'm talking about, is everybody comes up and says, oh, we have to do stuff for the young adults. We have to do it started a lot younger than young adults. We have to start at about 14 because we have, Cheyenne itself has lots of stuff for kids to do until they reach about 14. And after 14, they have nothing to do. Uh, I'm very interested in the budget. I can't give you any quotes on what the budget is or what's going to be done with the budget because I'm not at the cool kids table and I haven't been privy to see what the budget is. I don't know how much money we have in there. I don't know how much money is, uh, 
supposed to be going out and what the programs are and what kind of special interest groups are wanting money out of that and what the expenses are. If I'm elected, I will be able to get in and get that information to make an informed decision on what we do with the budget. There is a lot of things that are going on with the state that, you know, that we have going. Uh, a lot of programs that I have personally had uh, supported in the past have been done. So I think uh, to, you will find that I have some very good ideas. I'm rather different. I'm outgoing. I uh, believe in uh, taking good, thinking outside the box. So I hope that you, you'll vote for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And, I, and we'll go ahead and start the questioning with, uh, with Mr. Eklund. Um, so it'll be a minute and a half. And uh, I want to start with an issue that um, has been um, discussed a lot in the legislature the past few sessions, which, which is the uh, reliance of our state on the energy industry and how it's really uh, had our revenues uh, that we relied on for a lot of pretty basic services crash. So. Um, in that effort, um, the legislature has worked with the governor to pass the endow um, effort. It's you know to uh, diversify the economy. Uh, last session, there were efforts to say uh, spend our state savings account with very very low interest loans to help boost businesses. And I guess the question is, what is the role of the state to use public funds, public efforts to boost the economy, to diversify the economy? Um, where do you stand on that? Is that the role of, of the state government? It, the role of state government is to pick up the, the parts and pieces of, uh, uh, for the public and for the people that the federal government doesn't take care of. And there are parts of our government that are constitutional that we have to take care of, the schools being one of them. Um, medical, Medicaid, handicapped, and, and a variety of other ones that constitutionally or federally mandated we, we have to take care of. Um, there is a litany of other, other uh, things that we, we pay for and take care of. Uh, we've tried not to cut them too hard. There are things like uh, the, the local governments receive a, a funding that is fairly important to them. Um, the role of state government, I believe, when we do have the, the money to do it, is to help the, the public along any way they, they need to. Um, the, uh, as far as the uh, um, I'm, I'm at a loss for, <laughs> for time here, but and I can't go into it so I'll, I'll probably just end. Well, and you, go, you have the, an extra chance at 30 seconds, half a minute, when, when the uh, other answers are given. So you can be gathering your thoughts at that point. Uh, Mr. Edmonds, do you want me to ask the question again? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the, the legislature has been struggling the past few years to make up for the loss of revenue with, for, from the energy industry and to help businesses. And one of the things the legislature worked with the governor on this endowed program, had a lot of moving parts, but basically to diversify the economy. And last, um, last session, the legislature um, approved a lot of very low interest loans, uh, loaned out the savings to boost businesses and that sort of thing. Um, do you agree with that use of the state to use public funds to boost business um, and, and get the economy rolling again? Yes, I, th on certain programs, yes, I agree with that entirely. One of the programs that I was really interested in, it, it suddenly, uh, that I was supporting on the last election that has become a, a thing, is I wanted the University of Wyoming and the industries in, involved in energy to get together and make a program to research to where the University of Wyoming would get a program that would capture all the carbon coming out of the uh, coal that we produce. Well, I was told by certain members that, that that would be impractical, but I've noticed that uh, this has got a plant up in Gillette, Wyoming, right now that they just opened up this spring to do exactly that same thing. The, uh, the state is responsible for helping to get small businesses going. Small business is the backbone of our economy. Uh, we don't, the only big business that we basically have in Wyoming is city, county, state government. And those aren't revenue producing forms of, gov uh, of money. That's money that we, the taxpayers, are putting in there 
So what we have to do is we have to have this coming in, you know, from areas, other areas. One of the things that I am against, I am against uh, income tax, and the reason being, we don't have enough people in the state of Wyoming to do an income tax. It's just impractical. So uh, there's a number of other programs that are in there, and as I said before, I need to be in the state legislature to find out what we are doing and what we have and what we need to put out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pasqua. Um, so what I would say is, what we keep forgetting is that we should fully fund education because the citizen, those students become citizens. And one of the best ways that you can diversify the economy is through those citizens. The students that you've just fully educated will stay in your state and then they can help come up with ways to diversify the economy. So if you fully fund the education system, then they can come up with ideas on how to diversify the economy. Um, so I think that we keep forgetting that when we fully fund education, that's the best way we can diversify the economy is the citizens that stay in the state. Okay, thank you. And so I will throw it, if, if anyone wants to add a comment. Well, I, oh, yeah, I, did you want to, I think, uh, okay. uh, you know, Following the, uh, the, order. The, the, the order, um, I'll just go ahead and yeah, say, if you do have something to add. There, there are a few states that fund education as high as Wyoming. Right. I know that there are some apples to oranges um, conditions you have to look at. One of them is the distance, the rural, the, the fewer students and the cost per student in Wyoming. But uh, there's a lot of a lot of question as to whether it is fully funded or whether it was overfunded. I do know that the revenue for the state of Wyoming was was such that we couldn't fund any more than we did last year. And we went into savings as well. Okay. Um, anyone want to add another 30 seconds? Okay, go ahead. Yes. This is a phrase that I am so tired of hearing everybody. It's the catch-all phrase. Let's diversify the economy. This is the biggest misnomer that uh, politicians are putting out. Number one, there have been articles out on how we cannot diversify our economy without destroying our uh, infrastructure. Because if we bring all these people in, we do not have the tax base to cover it. And diversifying the economy, it's great for you know saying this, but the problem is that you have to have some means of being able to do it, and we don't. Okay. Did you want to take another 30 seconds? I would just add that that was, I was using Mrs. Herman's uh, words that she asked about the endow, and you mentioned diversifying the economy, so I was just restating what you had said. Right, and, and, that, and that was the ostensibly, that is the purpose of endow, it's a multi-year program, so. Okay, thank you, and do you have a, okay. Um, okay, and this, and this time, we'll, we'll start with you, Mr. Okay. Evans. Um, School funding, for the most part, comes to districts and block grants. We've talked about how much money, but let's talk about the, um, what the legislature struggles with er yearly. Uh, it comes to districts as block grants. In the push and pull between legislative spending control and the local control for school districts, where do you stand? I am for local control because local uh, schools know where the money needs to be spent. The state, yes, does the need to have some control on being told where the money is going and what it's being spent on, but I think the local districts are the ones that actually come in and make the determination on what that money is going to be spent for. And uh, now that, that's uh, their basic operating expense. That does not get into the capital the construction expenses or anything such as that. It's the, the basic stuff that they get for taking care of, you know, the day-to-day -day education requirements. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Pasqua, where do you stand? In, and do you want me to repeat the question? Would you, would you mind, please? Sure. Um, uh, the uh, school funding, for the most part, comes to districts as block grants. It's a, it's a funding formula, and the, and the district gets the block grants, kind of spends it as it dis with discretionary. Um, in the push and pull between legislative spending control and local control by school districts, where do you stand in that? Do you where, where do you fall? Do you do you favor greater state control or leaving it local control by the districts? Uh, I, I would support local control. Obviously, I think that local districts they know how best you know to spend the money that they of their district, correct? Um, but I think that what happens is that the funding comes to the district and it's not there's not equal funding. 
if, if you know what I'm saying. So we hear a lot of push and pulls that you mentioned. So that's where, I, and I don't know, I, I'm not sure what else to add to that. Fair enough, fair enough. Representative Eklund. Well, I think all of us agree that local control is best. The, the local uh, school boards are the ones that know what's best for their, their constituents and their people and they're closest to it. Um, I do, I, I realize that the school districts also are mandated by a lot of federal control and that there's not a lot of federal dollars going into it. It's a small percentage and an awful lot of control from our federal government. Um, as far as the, the state goes, it usually just opens up uh, avenues and programs and, and there isn't a lot of push and pull. And one thing we may have some trouble with is funding the, the infrastructure of schools, the, the buildings and whatnot. There isn't anything preventing the locals from uh, passing a bond and, and building the things that they need regardless of court cases that insisted the state needed to be able to step up and take care of that. You can, I know of one high school that they took all the money that the state wanted, uh, uh, allowed them, and they bonded themselves for another, um, I don't know what it was, 25, 30 million dollars and built a, a really nice high school out of the deal. So uh, I think it's a partnership between the state and the, and the locals and local control should should be most important. Okay, thank you. And I guess, uh, does anyone want to add anything? 30 seconds? It sounds like you're kind of in agreement, in general agreement. And you're right, the Laramie High School is a, is a wonderful facility. I know this is getting at that. Um, and, you know, it was pointed out to me that uh, we uh, told people that we were going to start out with a very general question about the top three issues facing um, the state and um, and how to deal with them. But I think actually what I'm going to do is kind of wrap up with that, and you may get some ideas from the from the questions that, before we get there. And um, so I'm just going to do something novel and maybe end up with that. So maybe you'd be thinking about those three top issues facing the state and how you would how we would solve them. Wyoming is facing a serious. Oh, and, and we'll again we'll start with you, Ms. Pasqua, circling around again. Wyoming is facing a serious and very expensive problem on how to house and care for prison inmates right now. The, 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 the prison in Rawlins is sinking and um, it's estimated it's going to cost between 50 and 100 million dollars to replace it when we get to that point. Um, would you support efforts, would, would you support um, finding alternatives to incarceration um, and also maybe uh, would you look at ways to restore funding for substance abuse treatment um, and as or any other solutions to this problem which is um, which is is, uh, is really urgent and is very expensive for the state okay um, I appreciate the question actually um, so what I believe is that we've been incarcerating people without we just we don't really take the opportunity to take care of the needs of prison inmates um, basically what happens is they sit in prison. Um, and I'm not suggesting that they don't deserve to be in prison for a crime that they've committed. So don't misunderstand that. I want to make that clear. But I think there are people that are in prison that um, have mental illness. And their mental illness goes untreated. And um, I think that ma mainly the reason it goes untreated is because we don't have the resources to treat that. And as we know, in our state, we also have that problem across the state. There aren't mental health facilities. We don't have, we have very little mental health facilities in our state. We need more of those as well. So what I would say is that I absolutely would support um, increasing mental health for not only inmates, but we need more facilities in our state for people who are not in prison. Okay. Thank you. Representative Eklund. Do you want me to repeat the question, or do you kind of... I, I think I know. Okay. Um, so, Rollins, we've determined a, a fix that will probably stretch this thing out for, for quite a while. Um, when it is rebuilt, it, it would be the third, if we rebuild it now, it would be the third prison in, in 30 years, which is outrageous. They, they, hopefully they'd never build it on a, a sinking lake again. But back to the... Um, I disagree with my opponent here about 
about Wyoming's care of prisoners. We have the lowest, uh, of, of the lowest revivism rates in the country. We, our Wyoming prisoners usually do not return to crime. And, and it's been in the top three for all eight years that I've been around, sometimes the first and the best in the nation. So whatever we're doing in the prison system is pretty good. Um, as far as alternative programs, I, I think we have a lot of them. And I, I don't know as it's a legislature's job to determine whether somebody ought to be in, in prison or, or paroled or whatever. That's, that's part of the judicial system. If they're, if they're in prison, that's out of, kind of out of my hands and out of my, my league and my pay grade. Okay, thank you. Mr. Edmonds. Well, our president is thinking, and I think it's kind of funny because I think that they were told that land they were building on was going to do that. But the thing about it is, is building new prisons, building new facilities, nobody in this state wants a prison in their backyard. Nobody. It's been attempted before, and it has been highly fought and told we don't want this here because they, they're afraid of what's going to happen if they, we, they start getting prisoners around their uh, cities and stuff like that. So they come up and they get large groups of citizens to demand that they uh, don't be allowed to build them. Okay, uh, so that's just it. I think that we're going to have to do a fix on our present pr prison. And as Mr. Eklund said, yeah, they, we've got some things in the works right now to take care of that problem. Uh, unfortunately, the, our present prison isn't going to be probably a solution on it. Uh, programs for taking care of people. We have a lot of programs in our prisons. Uh, if you have noticed, most people go to prison. It's like going to college. You have people go in there, and the only thing that they have time to do is exercise and read books and learn, uh, and learn law so that they can come back out and they can uh, defend themselves against the people that put them in prison. And a lot of times it works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I am, you know, and I'm, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to respond. But I just as a real quick, um, just a follow up to that. Let me just ask real, real briefly, going through the room real quickly. Would you favor looking at the mandatory minimum sentences that are in statute? That, um, or would you favor giving more latitude to judges to vary the sentences and maybe cutting down the number of people incarcerated or the length of incarceration? And I guess that's just a you know, if you could take just half a minute to respond to that, if you want, if you uh, optional, I guess, but I'd like you to weigh in on that. Could you repeat what you, okay. would you repeat what I you just, just said? Yeah. My very lengthy question, it was that would you um, support the legislature looking at the mandatory minimum sentences in statute, the, the where it says you must serve X amount of time without letting a judge perhaps use an individual judgment on the length of time uh, that a person is sentenced? Well, actually, uh, to be honest with you, I support judges. I mean, they went to law school, they became judges. You know, they, we, we elect judges, um, so I, I support them making the decision. Representative? Yes, I, I would agree with that. I, our system is set up with, with three branches, and, and I trust the judges could make a better decision on it than the legislature. Um, I'm not sure that we have a lot of problems with that, with mandatory this or that. I'd like to get back, though, to, to a problem in the prisons is keeping prison guards around. And maybe we need a program to, uh, for prison guards because we just we have trouble, especially in Rollins, keeping, keeping them around. We're bringing them in from Torrington all the time, and, and that's a bigger problem than the, than the present prison problems. Mr. Edmonds, do you want to weigh in on the question I asked or add a, to expand a bit? Ms. Okay, the questions you asked, yes. I think the judges are, have the, they're, they're local, they have the best thing on take what it is to put somebody in jail or to put them on probation or whatever, or stuff like that. But the thing about it is we have a lot of victimless crimes out there that mandate that people have to go to prison for. Like you get, if somebody gets stopped with a couple of marijuana cigarettes or something, you know, is trivial like that, and they have to go to jail for that. That's stupid. It's stuff like that should be taken care of. Okay, thank you. And since I kind of um, took away your, your optional response time, does anyone have anything to add at this point? Or? All right. 
Um, and speaking of marijuana, we'll, we'll move on to that topic. Some uh, local leagues of women voters around, this, uh, around the country have positions on medical marijuana. Would you support legislation that allows marijuana for medical treatment? Uh, and and I, I guess I, I should have... Uh, so I think we're, we're starting now with Representative Eklund. Okay, and then the second part, so about medical marijuana, and also, would you support... Um, um, possession is one of the lowest law enforcement um, priorities in the state, you know, just lower the enforcement of that. So, on the topic of marijuana, very handily introduced by Mr. Edmonds, uh, medical marijuana and then the enforcement being a very low priority. I'll start with the enforcement. Um, there is, there's very little enforcement. You could be on your third time with caught with marijuana and you're not gonna you're not gonna see the inside of a prison there's a lot lesser crimes decriminalizing marijuana isn't a good plan the medical marijuana um, maybe maybe not what I do know is that there's a distinction between THC and um, um, the, the part that makes you high and the part that it has health benefits and and I'd be in favor of allowing people to have the, the uh, health benefits that, that can be extracted out of the marijuana, especially hemp. It's easier to get out of hemp, and then you don't have to worry about the, the high and the, uh, the decriminalizing something that probably isn't, isn't a good plan. All right, thank you. Mr. Evans, do you want me to repeat the question? or? No, I'm just okay. formulating my answer. Okay. Hemp, folks would be one of the greatest products we can give our Wyoming farmers to grow. Hemp has no THC in it, the active ingredient in marijuana. Hemp can be used for so many products, and it grows everywhere. So it would be a great cash crop for our farmers. Um, I personally believe I spent 26 years as a narcotic suppression officer. I've probably seen more drugs in our entire Cheyenne Police Department today. As, as I was, worked with a really super dog. The problem with, uh, with marijuana is I see no reason why marijuana is not legal, period. Okay, if it was legal, period, we would be able to tax it, regulate it, support it, uh, and take care of any kind of thing that goes on with it, and we could bring our state a ton of money. And as uh, everybody's saying, oh, you're going to have people out there they are going to be shooting, you know, doing the uh, reefer madness thing. In the years that I was a law enforcement officer, I never met a violent stoner. I met thousands of violent drunks. Never a violent stoner. So I think that marijuana is kind of a situation, you know, that uh, I probably am in disagreement with my colleague here, but I think marijuana should be legal. Period. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Edmonds is not in disagreement with this colleague because um, he kind of went ahead and took what I was going to say. I believe that it should be legal and I think we should tax it and we're talking about revenue streams. Yeah. So why not? All right. Very good. And is there a 30 second rebuttal in here? Okay. Yes. I'll defend what I've, what I've said. The state to the south of us has a, a thriving black market so you won't necessarily get a lot of tax money out of legal or otherwise. Um, and and that just bypasses the whole system. It is then it causes problems with all the states, all your neighbors around. We have got the stuff flowing into Wyoming, and our biggest problem is from a state south of us that's, that's legal. And I'm not interested in legalizing something that has caused the, the problems that this drug has caused. Okay. Did you want to? Yes, I did. Legalizing marijuana. The very first step you do in legalizing marijuana is you've got the cartels. The biggest drug smuggled into America is marijuana. And if you make marijuana legal, why are they going to want to smuggle it in? Oh, black markets are really a little bit. But the thing is, you're going to gut the cartels, you're going to increase our tax base, probably get our country out of its national debt by the taxes that would come out of it, because it would be such a deal that it would be heavily taxed. So. Thank you. Do you have anything to add at this point? Or? I would just say that I'm not sure that 
um, Colorado would be maybe the best example to use. I'm not sure that they um, handled it appropriately when they legalized it. So I, I think that there's no reason we couldn't try and learn from what Colorado did and try it a little bit better. Okay, thanks. Um, I have two questions left now. Is, are there, were there any from the audience that um, said that? Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and we'll finish up the list I have at this time. Um, so considering, and now that we're on smokables, I guess, uh, considering Wyoming's high rate of tobacco use and the public cost of tobacco-related illnesses and death, would you support a tax on cigarettes at a level to discourage young people from starting to smoke? And the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network says that should be at least a dollar. Starting at a dollar, you would start having that effect. And, uh, and we're going to start with Mr. Edmonds. Uh, what, what do you think about a tax on cigarettes to keep young people from smoking? I agree with that. The reason being, I'm an ex-pipe and cigar and tobacco chewer. But the thing about it is, I went cold turkey and I stopped. Why did I stop? It was too expensive. The problem about kids, it's cool to smoke cigarettes. And, you know, and it's really terrible because once they get into that, the tobacco industries have admitted that they have put additives in the cigarettes that are addictive so that, to get people hooked on smoking cigarettes. Well, if we get in there and you just, you know, put a tax in there that's going to be prohibitive from people actually buying it, and I don't think it should be like a dollar. I mean, I... In what, a pack of cigarettes in New York is almost nine dollars, and here it's like five dollars. Why don't we get up to about nine dollars for a pack of cigarettes? Sure, there's gonna be a lot of people get mad, but the thing is, is how many people are we going to discourage, and how many people are we going to help quit at that price? Thank you, Miss Pasqua. Um, you want me to ask and do the question? Well, again? No, I, I understand. Um, I was just thinking about, don't we have one of the lowest tax rates of any state? Yes, we do. So, um, and people still smoke. So, I, I'm assuming that if we raise it, it, people will still buy it. It's addictive. So, I would. Def your question was, would you be in favor of raising the tax? Yes, I would. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reckland. I, I would be too, and I've supported it each time it's come around. It's the nasty T word is the reason it doesn't get, you know, to tax not tobacco, but taxes. You say that word, and there are a group of legislators that reel backwards. Um, the, the only people that would be affected by the uh, tobacco tax are border towns. Um, people may cross the border, but at, since we're about as low as uh, low a tax as anybody, I don't. I we could raise it quite a bit more than what it is. I don't know what it is for sure, but. Anything that would discourage, probably education is going to di discourage the young people. And I, I think uh, family and, and other things will probably have more to do with whether the kids start smoking or not. Um, they'll find money to, to be cool, as my opponent said over here, more than likely anyway. But the, and the tax is good for them, at least the second pack, maybe. Okay. 30 seconds, then we want to take a, an extra shot at that. All right. Um, so one more question before I, I get to the, the, three, the three big issue thing. Um, the Wyoming legislature has exempted itself from state open meetings laws, so committees can meet behind closed doors. Should the legislature ex subject itself to the open meeting laws the same as local governments have to? And we'll start with Ms. Pasqua. Yes. All right. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I, I feel like if, if we expect everyone else to do something, why make an exception? What are, it, it almost feels like, what are you hiding? All right. As someone who has served under that system, what do you, uh, would you like to tackle that? The, probably the only time that we don't have open meetings would be the caucuses. Is that what you're talking about, referring to, to well, caucus? And, and this shouldn't come off by uh, the representative's time, but just to respond that um, at the end of the session, a lot of the conference committees, um, they were handling very delicate uh, negotiations, chose to meet behind closed doors. They did not meet in the open, and um, it was okay. so. 
I wasn't aware of it. I would disagree that they shouldn't. These, um, so the open session and the, the decisions that are made, especially at conference committee, oftentimes a bill is changed massively by, a, by three people. Um, of course, the whole body has to vote on it later. And that might be the, the best reason for having it open all of the time. And, and uh, as far as open meetings, I, I can guarantee you probably every, every board, every school board um, group of, of committeemen in, in just about any area or field break that rule and, and meet and talk, talk shop at the coffee, when they're over coffee. But, I would agree it needs to, um, pu public meetings, especially the, the conference committees, I, I had no clue that any of that happened, and I am sorry that it happened, but I guess I can discuss that with colleagues. Caucuses sometimes are very important. We had a very sensitive issue that, that needed to be talked in, in in caucus behind closed doors, and our speaker talked to the Republicans, and then he had to go talk to the Democrats as well so that we knew what was going on. We didn't want to bring that and air that to the public. So okay. I can think of times when we need it. Mr. Edmonds, do you, you want me to read the question again? or? No, I know. I'm okay. just, like I said, I, I'm just saying you're trying to think of what I want to say. Okay. Transparency is the basis of democracy. Without transparency, you don't know what your government is doing. And the, the thing about it is, any time that you have a government that wants to hide what they're doing, I don't think the, the public should trust that form of government. Because it's proven in, in the past, in history, that every time a government st started hiding stuff and doing things in secret, that nothing good came out of it. So I'm all for transparency in government. Yes, there are some times that I have seen things that, you know, that they need to discuss, such as say that they're getting ready to discipline a member of their, uh, their, their cells, some, a member of the legislature, something like that. That needs to be private. But uh, for anything coming out and dealing with a bill or an issue or something like that, it needs to be transparent. Okay. Thank you. Does uh, anyone want to, it seems like you're mostly in agreement on that, so but just 30 seconds more? or. The, I guess I would talk a little bit about the private meetings that I do know of, the caucuses, at least with the Republicans, when we go into those, those meetings. We never come out of those meetings in agreement. There's sometimes power, you know, a, a feel for how the representatives are thinking on it, um, but it goes to the floor and, and you've got uh, representatives going every direction. I've never been told I have to vote a certain way at those meetings either. Okay, excellent, good. Okay, well, now we'll get to that. The question that was supposed to be an opening and now it's a concluding question about three issues facing the legislature, facing the state, and um, how you would, um, solutions, and if you want to, just the top one issue, if you want to reduce it to one issue and how you would handle it. Um, and we'll start with uh, Representative Eklund, and then, and then you'll have time to, for your closing summation. So, we have a minute and a half. Minute and a half. Minute, a minute and a half. Okay. The solving the budget problems—that's the biggest deal. We're using our savings account to to balance the budget right now, and we can only do that for about uh, ten bienniums or so, like twenty years or so. We need to solve it before that because the rainy day fund was not easy to fill. Um, there are all kinds of, I've had people call me up and say they don't, whatever you do, don't raise taxes on no fuel tax, but I want the road fixed out in front of my house. So it's really a tough deal on solving that, that problem. Civility with, within Wyoming, we do not have to act like the rest of the country. And we don't. Um, there's a little bit of it going on now that, that bothers me and I, I'd like to see, see us remain civil. I, believe I can go to any desk in legislature and talk to, to my colleagues about everything. We won't agree, but I should be able to talk. And then maybe <clears throat> as a third one, our revenue is not keeping up with the infrastructure needs that we have. The roads, the technology, uh, we paid $800,000, I'll talk about that later, but 
buildings and, and all of these, it just costs far more than, than we're bringing in in revenue and we're depending entirely on the mineral industry to, to foot the bill, almost entirely, 70 to 80 percent. And uh, we, need to, we need to solve that problem. And uh, those would be my three, my three main ones. Thank you. Mr. Edmonds. I agree. The budget is the biggest issue that we're going to be facing for quite a while in our state government. And the thing about it is, as he was saying, the income does not match the outgo. So this is, you know, creates a negative flow of money. And when you have a negative flow of money, everybody knows here that you can't survive doing that. And after a while, you're just going to run into the situation to where, you know, you've you got to quit robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, when you have a situation such as that, all kinds of things are going to get affected. You're going to be affecting uh, primarily education, and they're going to be wanting to be fully funded. And the, uh, the, the courts have mandated that we have to fully fund uh, education. But what happens if there's no money there to do that? What happens, you know, when it gets out there, you know, and uh, there's no money for any of these programs? You can't bleed the carcass dry, you know, if, the car if there's no blood in the carcass, you can't get any more out of it, so that has to deal with the money. I just think, you know, in a, a situation that we have to come up and we have to start thinking about alternative revenue streams to get this in. That's the primary issue that we have facing this state. The uh, number uh, issue we have facing the state is keeping our youth in this state. I've already been affected by this because my children will never come back to the state of Wyoming. They've told me they hate the state of Wyoming because there's nothing for them here. So that's what I figure a couple of the issues are. A lot more. Okay, Ms. Pasqua. So my top three, um, we have to build new revenue streams, as mentioned by the other, my other two colleagues here. Uh, we have to fully fund education. No surprise that I'm gonna mention that. And uh, we have to expand access to health care. You know, when I was looking up the statistics of what our um, legislatures cut, and when I found out that they cut over $100 million to the Department of Health, and that Medicaid, okay, so we don't have a lot of people on Medicaid in our state. We have over about 14% of our population on Medicaid, but 70% of those people on Medicaid are kids. Okay, so poor kids. And if we want to fully fund education, and we need to we need to find revenue streams, and you know that means we might have to tax our citizens. And I know nobody wants to talk about that, but I'm I'm going to mention it, and I'm going to say that that's what we need to do. So my top three are, you know, we need to come up with new revenue streams. We can't just keep cutting, cutting, cutting our way out of it. And we've got to fully fund education, and we've got to expand access to health care. Not only fund health care, but get health care to people who need it in our state. Okay. Thank you. Um, 30-second rebuttal? Uh, uh, am I next? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so half of our general fund is going into the medical, and most of it is federally mandated. So we are spending a lot of money on, on especially Medicaid, but there are other, there are other parts to this. Uh, the disabled and the handicapped are, are two big, big items, and I think they need to be taken care of. As far as the school being fully funded, um, there wasn't a whole lot of cutting done this last year. Most of the cuts were done over the course of the last uh, three years, and some of them were pretty painful, but uh, we're still the highest highest cost per student education in the nation. So, Well, I agree. You know, the thing about it is, is you know, there are certain things that are out there that are going to have to be funded. Unfortunately, as I said before, if we don't have the money, no, nothing is going to get funded. That's just plain and simple. If you are a homeowner and you have no money, you're not going to be able to go buy that new car. Period. You know, and that's just that's the way that I'm looking at the state of Wyoming right now. If they don't have the money, they can't do it. That's why it's so imperative that we find additional streams of revenue. Okay. And did you uh, want to add, uh, Miss Pasqua? Did you have a, a an extra thirty seconds you wanted to take on it, or? Well, I think our legislature brought this up last term, and I'm all, I'm definitely support the lodging tax. I don't, it makes perfect sense to me. The citizens of Wyoming usually don't pay the lodging tax. People come over here and they pay a tax. So in my mind, hey, free money, free money, let's pay the lodging tax. So, I mean, when I go on my trip, you know, to 
Walt Disney World, I pay the lodging tax. I don't cancel my trip so because of the lodging tax. So, Okay, well, that wraps up the questions. I, um, we're going to have two minutes where you can cover something that you didn't have time to before. Um, summarize. Um, just use that next two minutes any way you want. And uh, so we'll start with you, Representative Eklund. You're the next one in line. So go ahead and uh, take your two minutes. Um, so we, I, I don't believe we've done a lot of cutting and very little taxing. And I, I don't believe that we can neither cut nor tax our way out of the problem that we're in. So we do have to find something that's a little different. Something that we have it, that is special is our savings account. And over half of the permanent mineral trust fund right now is, isn't even keeping up with inflation. It's just kind of sitting around. And I think that we need to get a team of experts in that can manage that money. It would generate, in my mind, generate anywhere from a quarter of a million, a quarter of a billion to to a half a billion dollars conservatively for the state. That would go a long ways in balancing a budget when you're you're only about that far over every year. Um, there are two things that that I I want to finish, and one is a skilled. Um, nursing center for veterans. Wyoming's the only state in the country that doesn't have it. We can do this without a cost to the state. The, the federal government will pay two-thirds of it. Wyoming has to pick up the other third. And it has to be paid for up front. We have the savings to put our third in. And then we pay off a, what would, that third would be a loan to the Veterans Administration. We would they would pay the loan off with a stipend that they're given to take care of our, our veterans. Our veterans deserve this thing. It's very important. And, and the biggest obstacle has been where do we put the, put the thing. There's always a fight over It's like a food fight over where to put it. Everybody wants it or everybody doesn't want it. The other thing is the RIS system. That one's hard to explain, but it's a $50 million system that we keep all of all the records of our citizen it's in a archaic language that if it goes down you can't get your license plate or your licenses i don't think we can even have an election if it goes down election day so it's, it's that important all right thank you mr edmonds final final two minutes um as i said i'm a lifetime member here and i am a veteran one of the things that i think that we need here in the uh, Laramie County in the Cheyenne area. This is a veterans cemetery. We have lots. This is a retirement area for veterans. And a veterans cemetery would be a great draw for our area here. And something, you know, to come in here nice and decorative and make it, you know, uh, compatible or it looks like something that they have down around in the Colorado area. And I'm sure there's a lot of we architects here who could design us something beautiful. Um, as uh, on the taxation into this, I am firmly against any kind of income tax because, I, like I said before, we have approximately 50,000 people in the state of Wyoming, and how many of those are kids, and how many, that, how many does that leave to pay an income tax? Maybe 150,000 after you get everybody all squared away. And so an income tax will not work in the state of Wyoming. I do think that we could come up with like two cent sales tax, though. And that would go uh, great for funding education. Uh, if everybody came into the state of Wyoming and paid two cents on the dollar for uh, a sales tax, and that would include everybody coming into Cheyenne, uh, all of our tourists and everybody else, I think that would be a great idea. And I think that would go a long way to furthering our education problems. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasqua. You get the final words tonight. All right. Um, so I'm Jennifer Pasqua, and I am a fairly young person who chose to stay in the state of Wyoming, and I am raising my, um, he's 10 now, who thinks he knows everything, um, and he's probably not in here because he was reading a book and he was like, I'm done with this, um, you know, their attention span. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to stay in the state of Wyoming, you know. I want to raise my family here because I love this state. My husband is a teacher also. He teaches at the, the college here, and I could go on and on about how I think we should fund colleges in our state as well. Um, but we don't have enough time for that tonight. Um, so I just, uh, I think that we need more young people to get involved in our system of government. And I think that I have a lot of ideas to bring to the legislature because I think that they get, 
the, uh, no offense, Mr. Eklund, um, but I think they get involved in their ideas that they've tried before and they're unwilling sometimes to listen to new ideas or try new ideas and they're afraid to try new ideas because it's not what we've done before it's not what we're, you know we, we as we were talking about before about the word tax people are afraid of tax but we're at a point right now in our state where we need to do something because i i support educators i am an educator and i want my son to keep getting the great education that he's received in the state and i think it's incredibly important to keep fully funding education and i understand that it's expensive but they are human beings they're not little widgets in a factory so it's important that we keep fully funding it so thank you all right thank you very much and uh if we can give them all a hand for the candidates <laughs> So welcome everyone to um, the second legislative forum for, by the League of Women Voters of Cheyenne. Uh, this is House D District 12, and um, uh, we just got through with House District 10. We'll be later be doing House District 44 next week, Senate District 5, and House District 7. And all those will be uh, being recorded. They'll be on YouTube, um, and we encourage people to watch it later, maybe... Um, and share information there, clips with uh, other people who are interested in those races. Um, and then in August, we'll be doing two other forums having to do with the county races and two state races, auditor and treasurer. But um, tonight, we have uh, one candidate for District 12 and two representatives of people who could not be here. Um, just real, real briefly, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization open to everyone. Uh, work to help people get involved in their government to be informed and to vote. We hope these forums help provide information. Uh, we urge people also to check out the candidates' materials and contact them with questions. Uh, we, the League of Women Voters of Wyoming, has put together a brochure with tips on how to choose candidates, just how to critically evaluate messages. And in addition, we've written up uh, principles of campaign integrity and again simply as an aid to voters as a way to evaluate candidates in their campaign and we also hope the candidates themselves endorse the the principles um, and put them to work in their campaigns um, just as a word to be uh, just to start out with um, we'll have two minutes to open uh, and then two minutes to close and the candidates can use those opening and closing periods any way they want and uh, in between, we'll have several questions. We'll try to get through questions. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to write down a question on the cards, we have league members here with pencils and cards to write, and we'll get to them as we can. You'll have a minute and a half to answer the questions, and then an extra 30, optional 30 seconds if you, if you want to add on to what you said or to respond to other candidates. And um, so let's I go ahead and get started. And just to explain to the people, um, that's not Clarence, and that's not Ryan. And um, just to say that those two people were unable to come tonight. And so um, Ryan Lindsay, um, who had a conflict at work, um, he sent a, met a statement that is going to be read by Jennifer Pasqua to start out, and that will form the two-minute uh, intro. And Clarence uh, Stiver, uh, who also could not be here, has uh, a friend of his and someone who knows him very, very well, uh, Jana Ginter, from Pine Bluffs, and she is actually going to um, answer the questions as he has kind of directed her. So um, you will see, soon see um, Jennifer Pasqua lead, but the other two uh, persons will stay. And then, of course, Connie Sarnacki will as the candidate who could come tonight. And yes. thank you for being here for this is House District 12. And um, so I guess we'll go ahead and start uh, the two minutes and um, our timer, Pat Hayes, will let you know when you're running out of time. So we'll go ahead and start with Ryan's statement. Hey. Good evening, fellow Wyomingite, Wyomingites. Sorry to miss this event, but I look forward to meeting you and talking about solutions to the issues we all care about. I've been out to talk to many of you and look forward to many more conversations about Wyoming's bright future. My goal in this campaign and in the legislature is to focus on the things that bring us together and make our state special. Investing in our education, improving our health care, strengthening our economy, defending our public lands, and building stronger communities. We can do all of this and more, so I ask for your help and your vote to get it done. 
please go to my website, Ryan, Ryan Lindsay for House 12, and I will see you all very soon. Thanks, and also, let's not forget to wish Wyoming a happy 127th birthday. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Connie Zarnacki, if you would like to take two minutes to introduce yourself. Sure, sure. I'm Connie Zarnacki, and I'm asking for your support to continue my love of service for uh, District 12, House District 12. I have lived a life of service um, to God, to my family, to my friends, to my employees, and to my students now um, through having raised my son, taking care of my parents and other elderly family members, and supporting my friends through life's ups and downs, I've laid a strong personal foundation of service. Currently, I serve my students as the director of the Laramie County Community College Surgical Technology Program. The program itself, I feel, is bringing better patient care to this community and to the people of Wyoming. Um, I've continued serving my community as Laramie County Republican Committee Woman for Precinct 1-1 and a Wyoming lobbyist. I am committed and ready to serve the people of House District 12. I'm a businesswoman with proven results through using hands-on administrative marketing and business development skills. I am able to take a business opportunity or program from initial concept to successful operation. I've been an established member of all of my professional organizations for over 20 years and am now a board member on the Wyoming, Colorado State Assembly for the Surgical Technologists. I thank you for hosting this, the League of Women Voters, and I thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, Jenna? Um, I'm here tonight representing my good friend, Clarence Stiver. I met Clarence Stiver 28 years ago, uh, believe it or not, in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, we were both stationed in the 533rd MI Battalion. Uh, Clarence Stiver was an E6 at the time, and he was in charge of um, procuring uh, the equipment that our unit needed to, to succeed in its mission over in Desert Storm. Um, he served not only in Europe, but in Southeast Asia, or Southwest Asia and stateside. Um, he grew up in Lyman, Wyoming, and it was kind of interesting running into a homie over in Germany. Um, and I also met his wife, Kim, at the time. They weren't married. Kim was my replacement in the 533rd, and I trained her to do my job when I left. Uh, they later fell in love and got married, and they have four children, two boys, two girls. Clarence now works for the Union... Oh, I forgot. He, um, he was awarded the Bronze Star in the military for his service at, in Desert Storm. He works for Union Pacific Railroad um, as a foreman for the fiber optic projects being done, which is why he's not here this evening. He is in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, but he's also worked on the T-Rex project in, in uh, the Front Range area, and he serves here in Cheyenne as well. Um, when you're in the military, you really get to know somebody well, like, like your spouse almost. You know their habits, you know their their idiosyncrasies, and I can tell you that Clarence Diver is rock solid. Uh, he does what he says he'll do, and he does it every time, and he makes sure that the people around him are equipped to do their job, and um, I entrusted my life to him, and, and I'm glad I did. He's a, he's a good man, and I would do it again. All right, thank you very much. So we're going to go to uh, start with a a question that you were sent by the league as a sort of a start to, to frame uh, this evening and and we'll start with um, Jana which is um, sort of a what what are the top three problems issues facing Wyoming um, not, not problems necessarily but maybe challenges and uh, what are the approaches that um, you'd like to see to those problems well the first um, major problem major obstacle facing Wyoming or challenge is, is the physical issues that we're facing. Um, our state is facing physical challenges uh, unlike any we have seen before. And um, we need to control our spending. There are many, many offices in the state of Wyoming that have not been audited in several years. Um, 
we need to do those audits, um, evaluate ways we can cut, evaluate redundancies, um, extra spending. Um, the other the other things that are um, challenges is our economy. We need to um, uh, come up with some regulations that don't hold Wyoming businesses back. Um, and the third issue facing our state is the issue of transparency. Our government needs to be more transparent to our voters, to our citizens, and um, I think in, in far as the economy goes, we need to um, um, focus on things such as clean coal technology. Our legislator, legislature in the past has had the opportunity to spend money on these programs and they refused to, to uh, invest in Wyoming's future. That's unfortunate and we need to change that. Right, thank you. Ms. Karnacki. Okay. You know, it, it's always difficult when somebody asks you to pick three things. So, um, when asked what issues and values uh, are important to me, they're education, health care, and veteran benefits. Um, education is something that no one can take away from you. Uh, we need to make sure that both our children and non-traditional students in the state uh, have the best resources that they possibly can and opportunities that we can offer them within a reasonable and conservative budget. There are many ways also to improve health care in Wyoming. Looking from the inside out, I am actually a surgical assistant, so I have, I have clinical experience also. Um, I would like to bring my knowledge to the table and share my ideas with other, uh, the other legislators, beginning with required certification for healthcare professionals to provide excellent standardized care. And last but not least, we need to make sure our veter veterans are getting the best care in the timeliest manner that they possibly can. I'm a mother of an Operation Freedom, Iraqi Freedom vet, the sister of a Vietnam vet, and the daughter of a World War II vet. So I understand the trials and tribulations that veterans have endured in the past and hope that we keep Wyoming responsive toward the future, uh, holding what they deserve and have earned for serving our country. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And now we'll go into the other questions that the League has put together. Um, and we'll, we'll start now with Ms. Arnecki, starting with a minute and a half. Okay. Um, and uh, what is the role of the state to underwrite efforts to develop business? We hear a lot about diversifying the economy or helping expand an economy that is now very dependent on the energy industry, for better or for worse. Um, we have low interest loans as possibility in the Governor's Endowed Program. What do you think about government uh, getting involved in that, um, in that, in that endeavor to uh, uh, use public money to uh, boost the and develop the economy? I honestly think that government should get involved in helping their state no matter what. Um, now to what extent? That's a whole different story. Um, I think we need to concentrate on helping you know the energy um, sector of our country and rebuilding that but I also think we need to bring new um, new businesses into Wyoming, new ideas into Wyoming. Um, the, legislat the legislature has started that, um, and, and I think that uh, when I'm elected, I would like to continue the work that they have done in this past session. All right, thank you. Ms. Ginter. Um, as far as the state investing in uh, businesses, we, we do that through programs such as Endow and through LEADS programs and so forth. I think that communities know what fits their community the best and what programs um, are best situated for success within their parameters. And um, I, I know that um, Clarence would want to act within the constitutional parameters of the state of Wyoming and whether that actually allows um, the state to intervene or, or to shore up businesses, uh, part of that is controlled by our Constitution. 
and we need to really make sure that we're, we're acting within those constitutional parameters. Okay, uh, an extra 30 seconds, does that someone want to add or, or respond? Okay, well, we'll, we, we will move on, and if you think of something later, you can use that in the, in the final two minutes. Um, school funding, for the most part, it's, it's figured out with the state formula based on per pupil in general, but um, it comes to the uh, school districts as a block grant to be spent as local decision makers to decide. In the push-pull between legislative spending control and local control uh, by districts, where do you stand? To what extent should the, should, should the state control versus the local district? or vice versa. And I guess, and I guess we'll, we'll start with uh, Ms. Ginter. Um, your well, turn. Clarence has um, received the Family Achievement Award for his advocacy work with families in the IEP program in our uh, public schools. Um, this is because he has children with, with um, some disabilities, including a daughter with an MS. Um, Wyoming ranks six among all the states as far as money spent on education. Uh, there are five states which spend more than Wyoming. New York, Vermont, the District of Columbia, Connecticut, and Alaska. Um, for the $16,000, a little bit more, per student that we uh, spend in the state of Wyoming, we have very little to show for it as far as academic achievement. Uh, there has to be accountability for that money that's being spent, and there has to be performance standards that must be met. Um, part of the problem is when you're dealing with core curriculum and so forth, uh, it's a federally mandated program, and it really is a one-size-doesn't-fit-anybody program. Uh, it was developed on the coast, and it doesn't fit Wyoming's uh, rural population very well. Um, but we need to uh, maybe look at that as a state legislature and, and decide where to go with that. Okay, Ms. Arnacki, do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, the if question? you wouldn't mind, okay. I'd appreciate okay. it. This has to do with school funding formula. It just seems like the legislature is always at odds uh, with school districts um, to um, once the districts get the money, that you know, to what extent should the government, should the state level determine how spending happens locally or do you think the local people get the block grant as it does now and pretty much decides how to spend it okay i'll speak i'll, fe I'll speak from a little bit of experience i was elected to an elementary school board uh, served for four years and i really believe that the legislature should work with the local school boards and administrators i think the the local school boards and administrators know exactly what they need most people in those positions choose to be in those positions and have the children's and students' best interests at heart. I also believe that what they ask for is generally not more than what they need. Most people on the boards are fiscally responsible that I've seen in, in at least my experience. So I think in working with the legislature, and the legislature having trust in the local school districts to give them the information they need to help make the decisions at the higher level, I think that's the way to go. Okay. Thank you. Did anyone want to take an extra half a minute? Yes, as far as local versus state control, I believe that the local um, school boards and school um, populations, parents, PTA groups, and so forth, um, know what's best for their areas. We do that in our uh, community colleges, and I think we should continue doing that in our uh, lower education, high school, junior high, and, and elementary school. Okay. Did, any, has anyone, do you want, want to add anything else, Ms. Arnecki? No, okay. thank you. All right. We will move on then. So Wyoming is facing a serious and very expensive problem of housing and caring for prison inmates. There's a problem with capacity, and with um, the condition of prisons and just the upkeep of that and health care for the prisoners. Uh, would you support um, alternatives to in incarceration for the length of incarceration or uh, alternatives to being imprisoned? 
and also maybe to restore funding for substance abuse treatment and other treatment for the prisoners while they're in while they're in our care, so to speak, in our in our prisons. And um, and we'll go ahead and start with you, Ms. Arnecki. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, in thinking about it, structures are always a problem. They're always going to be, we're always going to need to keep them up. So um, I'm going to sort of set that aside and talk about the inmates. Um, if I'm not mistaken, historically, Wyoming has had to send some of their inmates out of state, even years ago, uh, to be taken care of. So uh, the thought of an alternative way to help our inmates, especially with drug abuse and substance abuse. Um, I think that that may be worth looking into uh, to see if we would have facilities to rehabilitate them and help them to be better citizens in Wyoming. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ginter. Well, this is a huge challenge facing Wyoming because of the costs. The costs are extreme and yes, we were sending our prisoners to Texas for a number of years and to Colorado. Um, our prisons tend to be very punitive, and they are not pathways for better productivity down the road. And I think in order to have more productive people um, entering society afterwards, we need to provide not only um, drug and rehab programs, but I know kids that have been in prison. They come out of prison not even knowing how to write a resume. How are they going to get a job? unless we provide some of these basic job skills services while they're in prison, what are we doing? It's a failing system, not only structurally, but it's failing the good citizens of our states, including some of the young, young people of our society that are in these prisons. And um, I don't know, um, I really shouldn't speak any further than that, based on the fact that I haven't discussed it further with Clarence, so. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want anything more at this point? Another, uh, one of the follow-ups that I did ask the previous um, candidates is um, that our statutes are full of mandatory minimum uh, sentences that um, uh, don't seem to uh, give the judges a lot of latitude, I guess, you know, responding to maybe trying to prevent too much lenience by judges, but wh where do you fall on that? Would you be willing to look at those sentences and maybe uh, remove some of the mandatory minimums as a way to, you know, cut down on sentences? And I guess we'll start with Ms. Ginter as a, just a quick follow-up to that. I believe that um, we should look at those min mandatory minimums, reevaluate them, see if that's where we still stand as a state. Um, to do this, we would need to listen to prisoners, to judges, we would need to listen to citizens um, because, you know, it's not just the legislature that makes these decisions, it's our constituency. And so, sometimes the constituency wants very punitive measures, sometimes the constituency is leaning more toward, um, oh, that's kind of a silly thing to be incarcerated that long for. Um, we need to be a, a sounding board for their ideas. Mr. Arnecki, do you... How do you follow on that? I have to think this one through okay. for a second. Um, honestly, I think we should we should trust the judgment of our judges. You know, they have been elected. They they have their own system. There's a judicial system, and a legislative system, um, and and I think that that is something that needs to be discussed on that level. Okay, great. Uh, this will I. That can stew some more. If you think of something later on, you can go ahead and add that at the end, uh, with closing comments. Um, considering Wyoming's high rate of tobacco use and the public cost of tobacco-related illnesses and death, would you support a tax on cigarettes at a level to discourage young people from starting to smoke? And according to the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, that amount is a dollar or more uh, that, to have that desired impact. And I guess, you know, we'll start with, I, I, I think it was with you, Ms. Arnacki, but if you, how, how you Sure. How long do I have on this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so uh, cigarette smoking is nasty. I happen to be an ex-cigarette smoker, um, and I chose to quit 
when i was thirty eight years old i have since i am a surgical assistant and i perform surgery i have seen what happens from the inside out and it's not pretty so i would be in favor of a tax if it was going to deter anyone from smoking thank you miss ginter um clarence stiver's response to this question was no new taxes okay that's that like sums it up. It, it does. It does. So well. Okay. Um, does anyone? Did you want to add anything to that, Miss Arnacki? Or well, we'll move on to the next question. It was terse. Um, <laughs> so um, some leagues of women voters around around the country have positions on medical marijuana. So looking for your position, we'll start with Miss Ginter here. Would you support legislation that allows marijuana for medical use, medical treatment? And then the, or, and would you support um, uh, lowering enforcement of um, marijuana possession and use to the lowest priority? So it's about you know uh, med medical use and enforcement priority priorities. Clarence does not support recreational marijuana use. Um, he does support medicinal marijuana use. Um, and as far as growing hemp in our state to there, there are so many issues involving that. Um, for instance, it, it, in Colorado, they have a large population that can buy their products, but it's still illegal on the federal level to ship these products interstate. Um, you can do it intrastate, but not interstate. Um, as far as hemp and marijuana, the only difference is the, the amount of THC that's, that's in the plant. This puts a tremendous onus on the state of Wyoming to, to go out and measure these plants, make sure it's all within compliance. Um, and if it's not in compliance, if a farmer is invested in the seed uh, and it's out of compliance, we have to then, as a state, enforce the law and make them plow it in, and that's expensive. Uh, and the farmers stand to risk a, a tremendous loss there. Um, I think that before we completely legalize all forms of marijuana, we really need to discriminate between medicinal marijuana and recreational marijuana and what that means, and what does that mean in Wyoming, particularly. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Arnecki, you want me to repeat the question, or? I think I'm okay. Okay. I think I'm okay. Um, as far as medicinal marijuana goes, um, I would be in favor of it as long as there are um, dedicated guidelines and um, physician prescriptions for them so that the patients that are using this are uh, monitored because we have to make sure that we keep everybody here safe. Um, as far as legalizing recreational marijuana, I'm not in favor of it. Okay. All right, and, and uh, are you, are you, anyone any, have anything more to say on that? Well, as far as the, the uh, a lot of people think that, that hemp products can be very uh, um, beneficial in Wyoming, but you really have to look at, uh, Wyoming has less than a half million people in the population. How many people are going to be buying hemp products in Wyoming? Because we can't transport them. Um, is it really cost effective? We need to weigh that. and. Um, I think when we really weigh all the ins and outs, we're going to come up with the fact that it's too expensive. Okay, and uh, do, do you want to add anything more to that, um, Ms. Arnacki? Um, if I remember the question correctly, the hemp was not an issue in the question. Was and, and, it? and it I, was not, and, and yeah, it was about the medical marijuana right. and then enforcement. And I think some states reduce the um, uh, penalty to say a ticket versus again, you know, uh, higher criminal I'm, penalties. I'm fine with my response, thank okay. you. Okay, fair way to go. Okay, so <clears throat> the um, Wyoming legislature has exempted itself from the state open meeting laws. So uh, committees uh, can uh, meet behind closed doors and local governments are under the open meeting laws and there are certain very restricted list of occasions when they can close the doors. They have to declare it in the open meeting why they're going in executive session. Um, should the legislature join all the other governments if being subject to the open meetings laws where they can close 
only for certain reasons, like for instance, litigation, real estate, that sort of thing, um, would you be in favor of um, asking them to do so? And uh, I, I forget who we start with. I believe it's. I think it's. I think it's your turn. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, sure. no, no, it's okay. Okay. Um, uh, Clarence stands for absolute transparency in government. Um, as far as caucuses and so forth go, I think even most of those should be open to the public, unless they're dealing with personnel issues. Um, and I know Representative Eklund stated he's never been told to vote a certain way in caucuses. I can tell you that that's absolutely not the case when I was in the legislature. I was told how I was going to vote no if and or buts, and I think the public needs to be aware of things like that. I also think when it comes um, to making decisions on how to spend state money on real estate and so forth, why are we excluding the public? It's their money, it's not ours, and um, they, they need to know what's going on behind those closed doors. I think that when it comes to personnel or disciplinary things, well that's more sensitive and, and you wouldn't want your boss airing your dirty laundry in front of everyone either so I think that um, there are times but for the most part we need to make voting records public we need to be making um, all the meetings public and no closed meetings. Thank you. Ms. Arnacki, open meetings laws for the legislature? Coming again from the medical field and being very cautious about what people should hear and shouldn't hear. Um, I do believe though that we are elected by our constituents and should have uh, open meetings so that they know what's going on. Um, however, there should also be rules about uh, being able to go, go into closed session when necessary and then the public should know what those rules are so that they are not upset about someone saying, I'm sorry, but the session is closed for today. Please come back tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add anything else there? Yes, I do. Clarence has stated that there's a lot of the good old boy system still in place in Wyoming. And if we're going to win back the trust of our citizenry, we've got to make the bidding process in the state more transparent. Um, and uh, he wanted me to make sure that that came up tonight. The, the bidding process in the state needs to be transparent to everybody and and no, no, no good old boy deals. Right. Are we ready to go for closing now? It's uh, We rapidly moved on for that. I'm, uh, if anyone's ready to move on, we'll do that. Um, and so <clears throat> you'll have two minutes and um, you know, uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Arnecki, I believe, um, on this one for two minutes closing. And um, uh, I guess we would like, uh, if you could m include in that, um, I, I don't know if you've, you've seen our, our, our five principles. Yeah. And uh -huh. if, 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 you, if you're willing to take a, a stand on that, please, this would be a time to do it, if you chose, if you choose to. I mean, it's not It a would be nice if I could review it, because I haven't yeah. seen it in a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I know, wait, and I have to put my glasses on to look at it. Oh, it's bigger. Oh, here. We can, would you like to share? I don't know. Clarence is. Uh... Oh, I've, yeah. It came with the documents that he sent me, and I read it. Oh, there you go. So, um, okay. I. And for the public, I guess while they're taking a look at it, let me just very briefly read it. Um, candidates will defend the right of every qualified Wyoming voter to full and equal participation in the electoral process. Candidates will conduct honest and open campaigns stating the sources of facts used in their campaigns. Candidates will stick to the campaign issues and statements, debates, advertisements, and news releases. They will not permit use of, a char of character defamation or other attacks on opponents' personal or family lives. Candidates will disavow assertions that misrepresent, distort, or otherwise falsify the facts. And finally, candidates will publicly reject actions by supporters that violate these principles. And again, they're simply advisory. The League simply wrote them up as an expression of their own principles. And we just put them out there for people to take them and use them for what they're worth to the end. You know, there's no obligation to weigh in. But if you, if you had an opinion, we'd like to hear it tonight, I guess. 
So are you are you ready to go with your closing? Uh, I guess I guess I am. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you again for having me here. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and and looking at the principles for campaign integrity, honestly, if we can't all agree to this, then why are we running for office? Uh, it is not our place to judge people. It's our place to serve. Um, I am asking for your support as a candidate for House District 12. I feel that between my business background, uh, I have been a realtor for 35 years. I've been in the medical field as a surgical assistant for over 20 years. I'm an educator and I, I enjoy all of what I do and I'm hoping that uh, you will support me and I will be the new elected representative for District 12. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Ginter. I'm going to read um, the words that Clarence left me to read here. First of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. I decided to run for House District 12 because I saw a poignant lack of leadership for our House District and in the legislature in these difficult times. Our state is facing fiscal challenges unlike anything we have seen in the past and I see these challenges as a direct result of lackluster leadership in the legislature. Our legislature has passed important bills intended to help the citizens of Wyoming, but it's fallen short of following up to ensure they've been implemented as intended. Many of our state's agencies have not been audited in several years. I believe in transparency in our state government, and it is lacking, which has added, added, to, added additional problems to these difficult times is critical to elect a leader with integrity and vision. I believe I possess the skills needed to be that leader. As your legislator, legislator, I will work with other representatives to ensure unwavering support of our Constitution, fiscal responsibility, accountability, transparency in government, bipartisan partnerships are built and sustained. I stand on a strong Republican platform for the success of House District 12, the legislature, and the state of Wyoming, and I would appreciate your support in being elected to House District 12. Okay, thank you very much, and um, I failed to mention at the beginning that these are two, uh, two uh, Republican candidates, and uh, the job of voters on the primary will be to select who advances to the general election. So can we give please and thanks for uh, the candidates. Thank you very much, and we'll take a five-minute break, and then we'll have uh, House District 44. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Marguerite Herman. This is the League of Women Voters, a candidate forum, one of several uh, that we're having during the primary, and this is for House District 44. And uh, previously this evening, we did House District 10 and 12. Uh, next week we're going to do Senate District 5 and House District 7 and then in August we're going to be at the county fair to do county offices and um, two state offices, auditor and treasurer. But tonight we're doing the, um, the, the candidates. Uh, we are missing one, Paul Johnson, and we're going to have a representative read a statement from him. And then we have the, the Democratic candidate Sarah Burlingame and uh, Republican John Romero Martinez. Um, just a couple of uh, things, uh, uh, preliminary, uh, just to mention that we're recording this tonight. It will go up on YouTube um, relatively quickly, we hope. The um, primary is August 21st, although early voting has already started, so you can find information about voting, registering voting at the county clerk's office, um, really everything you'd want to know. And then, you know, the uh, election day voting center's information there. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization open to all uh, that works to help people get involved in their government, to be informed, and to vote. We hope these forums help provide some information, but we urge people to check out the candidates' materials and to contact them if you have other questions. In addition, Wyoming uh, LWV has uh, put together a handy brochure called Choosing a Candidate in Wyoming. We have many copies of that. Happy to share those. And it just is a little guide to how to critique candidates and their campaigns. In addition, we have written a list of five 
principles of campaign integrity. And at the end of this evening, the candidates are going to get a chance to weigh in uh, whether they uh, support those or not. Again, it's just a, a guide for uh, people looking for a way to evaluate candidates and campaigns. And uh, we'll get that get to that later. Uh, right now, um, just to say how the evening is going to go, the candidates will have two minutes to begin with uh, to do a um, just an introduction. They can use it any way they want to introduce themselves. There will be two minutes at the end to wrap up. And in the intervening time, we'll have uh, questions of a minute and a half to answer, and then an additional 30 seconds that to add on to, to supplement, or to respond to the other candidate. And uh, we have several questions prepared here. Uh, just let you know, people in the audience, they have an opportunity to write down questions if there's something occurs to you as the evening goes on or right now. We have uh, league uh, members here with cards to write those on and bring them up and we'll get to them as, as, be as best we can. Um, but to start out with, uh, the, there'll be the two minute question, uh, a question that we've actually given you ahead of time and then we'll get into the other questions and uh, we will Stagger the beginning person. I guess we'll start with Ms. Burlingame right now. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So that is not Paul Johnson there sitting there. <laughs> that actually is uh, Raj Liskey, um, a, a stalwart member of the media in Cheyenne, teacher at LCCC, and now an active league member. And she's going to read a statement that Paul Johnson submitted. He had. He had a, a professional obligation that kind of kept him away tonight, but we said we would read his, his statement. So um, why don't you go ahead and do that this time? Thank you. Um, dear League of Women Voters, I would like to thank you for hosting this important primary election forum. I commend your organization's commitment to promoting our constitutional right to vote. I hope you, my opponent in the Republican primary, and the Republican voters in my district accept my sincere apology for my absence this evening. I am a physician, and unfortunately, I have a schedule conflict this evening. I do appreciate the opportunity to at least provide you with this statement and encourage you to uh, visit my website, www.johnsonforwyoming.com. The most Pressing issues currently facing Wyoming relate to one, the economy, two, health care, and three, education. With my education and experience as a physician and small businessman, I am qualified to tackle these issues. We need to live within our means. However, responsible budgeting is difficult with the boom and bust cycle of our energy-based economy. We need to better insulate ourselves against future busts in the energy market. We need to continue to leverage our nat natural resources while diversifying our economy and revenue base into one of the 21st century. I'm committed to keeping burdensome regulations and taxes low so our state can thrive. I strongly oppose a personal income tax. Wyomingites continue to struggle with access to affordable and quality health care. This is particularly acute in mental health. The Wyoming insurance market sells our nation's most expensive insurance plans. As a physician, I have a unique understanding of the issue and potential solutions. We need to examine options to recruit and retain providers. We need free market solutions, including attracting additional insurance providers to facilitate competition in our market, and exploring regional insurance coverage across state lines. We should consider an ACA waiver to, redu to reduce premiums, like the state of Alaska. We should consider Medicaid expansion with a waiver tailored to Wyoming. The feasibility of this is thrown into question with the recent court ruling of the Kentucky plan. We have an excellent education system in Wyoming, and I am con 
committed to maintaining its excellence. I come from a family of educators. I graduated from our Wyoming public schools and have two children in the Cheyenne public school system. Cheyenne schools were hit disproportionately hard in the last round of budget cuts, and we are facing further cuts to the tune of three and a half million dollars over three years. I am committed to keeping dollars in the classroom for our teachers and students. I appreciate your vote in a Republican primary election on or before August 21st. Your neighbor, Dr. Paul E. Johnson. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now we'll do the two minutes from the candidates who are here, starting with Ms. Whirlingame. Thanks, Marguerite. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for inviting us. It's a great service that you guys provide to the community. And um, not just when I'm running for office, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is Sarah Burlingame. I'm a mother, I'm an advocate, and I'm the Democratic candidate for House 44. Um, I've spent the last 20 years sharing a message that I believe in. There's no place on earth like the great state of Wyoming. I've been a champion of local projects like the Laramie County Library. As a small businesswoman myself and a handful of other hardworking farmers and ranchers started Cheyenne's uh, first growers only farmers market and as an executive board member of the Cheyenne Arts Council it has been my pleasure and great delight to bring bands and artists to the capital city as the executive director of Wyoming Equality I've gotten to work with schools with churches with veterans and um, students of all stripes across our state and um, my husband Jason and I chose to raise our boys in Cheyenne because of the access to wilderness, the unparalleled public schools, and the warm community that welcomed us. You can ask anyone. There is nothing that I love more than convincing my out-of-town guests that they should move to Cheyenne. <laughs> but last year when pitching Cheyenne as a chosen city for the Tech Jobs Tour, it became clear to me that not everyone sees our city as we do. Not everyone sees a Wyoming of limitless opportunity and possibility. So when I was tasked with convincing Megan Smith, who was the Chief Technology Officer of the United States, to bring the tour to Cheyenne, I was made aware that in order to make the case, I needed to get involved. And I did. We put on the uh, Tech Jobs Tour. We hosted an event that um, offered more than 400 jobs. Um, and it was really energizing to be a part of this. I understood that we had a choice in front of us. We can position ourselves. As tech innovation leaders, we can go off the beaten path, or we can stick to our old model. I don't think our old model is working for us, and I hope the, the voters agree. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Romero Martinez. Thank you, Marguerite and the League of Women Voters. My name is John B. Romero Martinez, and I am a returning uh, candidate for House District 44. And for those that don't know me, just I'm going to reintroduce myself. But uh, for those that know me, I guess it's kind of a, a rerun. I was born in uh, the city of Cheyenne, and it was then named Memorial Hospital. I grew up in Harriman, Wyoming, which is a, an old railroad town. I want to say ghost town, but they just recently demolished all the houses, the Union Pacific did. and. It's now a ghost village. I went to McCormick and then Central High School. I went to Laramie County Community College for a couple of years and earned a associate's degree in sociology. I then went on to serve the Wyoming Air Force National Guard in the communications computer system plans and implementation flight. And just a little bit about myself, I uh, spent the last over 11 years working to promote not only a 100% pro-life uh, agenda, but also uh, supporting medical cannabis legislation throughout the United States. And if we're going to have a genuine conversation about innovation in healthcare, I think medical cannabis needs to be there at the front of it. And also the pro-life community deser deserves more 
from the Republican Party in regards to just putting a bullet statement that supports a national peace. We need to actually get involved in our local communities. We also need to raise the minimum wage. I might sound like a Democrat there, but I support just laws that support the dignity of people. Okay, thank you. Now we'll go into the question, starting with one that was sent to you initially and one contacted you about thinking about the main issues for Wyoming and your um, approaches to them. And we'll go ahead and start with you, John, if you want to go ahead and tackle that uh, sort of umbrella question. Uh, what do you see, in, and not just problems, I guess, but, but you know, big issues, three big issues for Wyoming. Three big issues? Yes, and uh, your, your thoughts on them, approaches to a, um, you know, if, the, if you have a solution to a problem, ideas you have. One thing I'd like to first mention is uh, we do need to we do, we need to tackle education and civil rights in the state of Wyoming. Uh, we we need to be more consistent in the way we approach those um, civil rights of protected groups should be more vigorously protected, insured, and safeguarded, strengthened through state legislation, policy and executive authority in public and private sectors and with an emphasis on the pre-born children protected groups under the federal mandate for example native american latinos hispanics blacks asians jews catholics etc and with special attention to the elderly who have become more victims of false compassion through euthanasia a repeal of the right to work law must move forward to ensure the dignity of workers and families and to bullet point I don't want to be redundant in my introduction introductory statement but we also need to think about reform for non genetically modified foods we need healthier foods in our market and we can't just have hospitals giving us genetically modified foods while they say that they're helping us and finally I think we need to have a comprehensive immigration reform bill on the state level. Okay, and then you'll have a chance to amplify on that after. Uh, so, Ms. Burlingame. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the, the three main uh, issues that I want to tackle uh, as, as a legislator are the economy, education, and public lands. Um, recently, I was uh, allowed to facilitate, I was allowed was asked uh, to facilitate part of the Endow Engage um, Summit that they had over in Laramie. So this was 250 millennials in one room bringing their best ideas to the table that the governor and the council were saying, we want to hear what would keep you here in Wyoming. And as some of you may know, um, the Endow Council has $40 million that they can do different things with, block grants, um, uh, respond to the needs of like of the local communities and there was so much passion and energy in that summit these are people who want to stay in Wyoming but they're not going to stay here if we don't have good paying jobs so things like the detention center in Evanston that's being sold as something that will bring in economic growth incorrect that's not a good paying job and that's not what our economy needs we need tech innovation um, we need uh, an economy that's responsive to the time that we're in. Education, my kids go to Pioneer Park Elementary, they receive one of the best educations on the planet. Um, that doesn't happen, uh, that doesn't happen without a lot of intention behind it. And so I want to support that, not draw down from it, and think that we'll still get the same results. Great. Thank you. Uh, do, do you want to take another 30 seconds to amplify or respond? Well, I want to say that I agree with my opponent from the other party on that. Technological innovation does need to move forward. I asked somebody at Laramie County Community College recently, where was Wyoming when Atari was getting its start in 1976? And someone told me, well, LCCC was in a room just barely meeting. Since one of the co-founders came from Utah University, Nolan Bushnell, it's just sad to see that we've lost the tech giant to a France owner. And centrally located, it just makes sense with the missile base that we that we do that. We innovate. 
Thank you. Did, did you have anything to add on this Berlin game? To no, I'm just learning that I speak slower than I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, we have we have plenty of, plenty of our chances left. Um, um, the uh, the I mean, the next question is is really sort of about state control versus local control uh, in the in the sense of school funding, which um, is is figured on a state level per, for school districts on a per pupil basis and it, and it generally comes to the school districts as a block grant with a lot of local discretion of school boards to decide how the money is spent. And recently we've been hearing uh, more from the legislature about how the state should have more control over the spending of that money. And so I guess where do you fall in that push-pull between uh, legislative control and local control and how the money gets spent and I guess um, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, I'm sorry we'll start with um, you Ms. Billing Gang. I'm selective. Um, thanks so much Marguerite. Yeah I think uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to read the Wyoming State Constitution and specifically what our founders who, who, who put together that document said about the necessity of equity in, in education, do yourself a favor and read it. They were wise beyond all measure. I think they saw this day coming and knew that there would come a time when poor students, low-income students, disadvantaged students in Wyoming would need that support, would need to know that we would give um, to, to them and to their education and that we wouldn't you know, rob Peter to pay Paul. So um, I'm, I'm not in favor of uh, redistribution um, of, of, of this control over to the state. I think if you look at the school districts in Wyoming, they've done an incredible job as stewards of that. Um, and the, the way that you know, we've seen here in Laramie County, how that plays out, I think is the proof in that pudding. Our kids are receiving a top-notch education. Um, where it stands right now, I think is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Romero-Martinez, where do you stand on that balance? I would just right off the bat say that I believe that I'm very biased because I went to Wellison Elementary School and so I'm going to speak from my experiences. I don't understand the problems as much as maybe 98% of people that are general citizens do because I had a 1 to 4 teacher-student ratio and had the scientific method memorized by the end of fourth grade and if I wanted to pass the class uh, John Daggett, our teacher at the time, said, I'm going to give you a blank piece of paper, a problem on the board, and you're going to have to be able to see, you're going to have, you know the problem, postulate some solutions, and, at, you know, go through the lab and see whether or not you can have any proof that, you know, you either prove or disprove your hypothesis. So, entering into fifth grade the same way. I think this debate, not trying to get off topic or anything like that, I think it's a discussion that needs to be had. I... I think, we, I think there's a deeper problem in education that we're not really looking at and we've seen for the last 20 years there's from no child left behind to wherever we're at now and who has control and doesn't have control. We have charter schools on the horizon that are they're outpacing. We have St. Mary's School that they're doing a great job as a private school. So right now I think it's an early debate and I'd like to enter into that debate and personally I don't really have an actual stance on that right now. Not to sound weak but to say that we need to have this discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, another 30 seconds, do you want to weigh in and go? Have, have we exhausted that topic? Or no, just to say that I think it's a really fundamental question, um, and I think it's one that voters were really engaged in this last legislative session, and, and I hope that we all bring our, our, our best solutions to the table. Okay. All righty, thanks. Uh, we will move on to... Um, prisons. Uh, and so Wyoming is facing a serious and expensive problem of housing and caring for prison inmates as far as capacity building, keeping a uh, building upright, and then, you know, as came in a, in a previous uh, um, forum, also uh, staffing it and, and keeping the staff, um, uh, attracting and retaining qualified uh, people working at the prisons. So uh, would you um, support um, alternatives to incarceration um, so to keep the population down um, and maybe restoring funding for substance abuse treatment which addresses the recidivism piece 
but I guess is looking for uh, um, alternatives to um, control the issue from the incarceration point of view. And I guess we'll go ahead and start with you, Mr. Uh, Romero Martinez. The answer would be, I heard a yes or no question in there somewhere, and I would say yes to bringing back funding to helping folks who have uh, committed crimes. We're building more prisons than uh, we're building schools, so it seems like. It seems like we're spending more money on prisons than we are with schools, and that's backwards. So we need to revisit that. When they cut the funding, and there was a lot of rhetoric about, oh, we need to cut the funding because the budget is big and we can't afford it. Well, when there's programs that don't ha help our community, we all see in our communities the guy a few blocks away that's just taking a dive. There's nothing we can do. There's no one helping them. The, the, we used to have these big billboards that showed what it looked like after meth and before meth. And we're suffering from these epidemics, heroin, marijuana is not that big of an issue anymore. It's eventually going to be regulated and become a medicine like it should have been a long time ago. But as far as these other types of addictions and afflictions that we face, we have to face them head on. And addiction is hard for all of us, whether it's me eating too many donuts or somebody or drinking too many beers. We all got we all got to kind of come up with some solutions together and it's not just going to be the easy answer anymore of let's cut because I believe in smog or you know we got to come up with real solutions and stop making excuses. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Birmingham. You want me to repeat the question? Sure. Okay. Uh, Wyoming is facing a serious and expensive problem of housing and caring for prison inmates. Uh, would you support alternatives to un incarceration? And uh, would one of those um, alternatives perhaps be substance abuse treatment? Absolutely. Um, we can't unring that bell that the prison in Rollins was built apparently on a swamp and that makes the um, maintenance costs very high. But what we can do is commit to our values of keeping families and communities together. And we know that there are programs that can help us do that, programs that address um, how frequently we incarcerate folks for nonviolent crimes. Um, we know that we have the opportunity in Wyoming because it was presented, I believe, by the Wyoming Sheriff's Association, put together a pretty significant study on restorative justice. And we have a restorative justice pro project here in Wyoming that is centered on the rights of victims. And I think there's a lot of um, misnomer sometimes about what restorative justice does and who it's for. It is um, absolutely centered on victims and victims' rights, but it is one way to keep communities and families together to address the issue that was caused in the first place, right? Um, and as long as they aren't violent uh, crimes that uh, where, where folks really need to be um, penalized in, in, in a prison system, then it's something that addresses it for much less cost to the taxpayers. So I'm, I'm all for... Um, programs like the restorative justice. Okay, thank you. Um, another 30 seconds, would you like to expand on that? Or? Generally speaking, I think as a ancient Christian, when we think of Jesus on the cross, and I was just having this conversation with, with my opponent earlier about the death penalty, bringing that into effect is the idea that there's one guy that repented and there's one guy that didn't, but in the end, Jesus suffered for all of our sins, died for our sins, if, if, for the, those of us that are Christian. It was pointless for him to suffer, just like it's pointless to make people suffer when we need to be trying to restore them. Also. Okay, thank you. Did you want to add anything at this point? Or? Okay, well, uh, considering Wyoming's high rate of tobacco use and public cost of tobacco-related illnesses and death, would you support a tax on cigarettes at a level to discourage young people from starting to smoke, which um, we've heard that level is a dollar, at least a dollar. And so where do you stand on that? And um, Ms. Burlingame. Nope. Yes. Yeah, that is a super easy one for me. Um, we're allergic to the word taxation in the state of Wyoming. Um, it causes us to break out in hives and, and perhaps not use our best rational minds. Um, and that's unfortunate because there is actually a pretty broad consensus 
um, when folks are asked in Wyoming, could we tax cigarettes, tobacco specifically, um, a dollar, even more than a dollar. Now, uh, what maybe if people understood that the money raised by that, it, it goes to three separate um, you know, revenue streams. It goes to the general fund, but it also goes to education, and it goes to the Department of Health. So those are, we've been we're gonna talk about the Department of Health, we're gonna talk about the Department of Education as places that need to be funded. Here we have a very simple way to fund it that is at our fingertips, and it's that allergy to, to taxation, I think, that keeps us from making that very obvious step. Um, would have folks been willing to pay more for something that they desire in the past? Absolutely. Does this criminalize or, or, or make smoking obsolete? Absolutely not. People get to smoke as much as they want. They'll pay a little bit more for it, and our state coffers will be the better for it. That's an easy win. Okay, thank you. Mr. Romero-Martinez, do you want me to repeat the question? Or? Please do. Okay. Considering Wyoming's high rate of tobacco use and the public cost of tobacco-related illnesses and death, would you support a tax on cigarettes at a level to, to discourage young people from starting to smoke? And uh, we've heard that that um, uh, additional amount is about a dollar a pack or more. It has to be about a dollar a pack. So I'm not really big on taxes, but... I'm just going to say I hate cigarettes and I hate tobacco. So I'm not trying to get any special interest money from any tobacco company because I just said it. I hate tobacco. I remember when I was a young kindergartner or something like that and my mom was a smoker and I just used to get so sick uh, inhaling it. It just made me gag. And I went to school one day and they were talking about if your parents smoke when you're in the house, we just want you to let you know that it is child abuse. There's a lot of parents out there that say whatever they do in their house is their business. And most of the time it is. If you're smoking cigarettes around your kid, you're committing child abuse. That's just the bottom line. So a tax that's worth a dollar, which is debated. I'm not going to try to make two sides happy on this. And I don't believe in a tax. I think you need to put a fee on it. And that fee should be $100. And yeah, it sounds extreme. And I don't care about what the tobacco companies say. Because I think if we're going to fund education or anything else, we go ahead with medical cannabis, we tax medical cannabis, and medical cannabis, you can smoke it all day, and you're not going to get sick like you're going to get from tobacco use. And so I'm pretty firm on that. I hate it. It's gross. It's nasty. And most people, like in, out inside in front of a church and you're smoking a cigarette, there's a rule how far you have to be away from that building. What do people do? They sit right out in front of a double door in these places, and you still, you still suck it in. Uh, it's nasty. It's gross. Secondhand smoke is worse than, you know, what, you know you know the deal. When the city debated this and they finally got rid of smoking in the city, we need to do that in the county. Okay, well, thank you. That was pretty adamant on both both counts. And did you want to have anything to add at this point? I just want to take the opportunity to be to the right of my Republican <laughs> opponent and say I think $100 is probably too much. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we can find some workable compromises. All right. In concert. Did you want to add or? She's probably right. I just okay. wanted to let the tobacco company know that okay. they've done too much damage. Well, and we'll, we'll move on to a subject close to your heart um, that some leagues of women voters have uh, taken position on medical marijuana. And I guess what we want is your uh, thoughts tonight on legislation that would allow for medical treatment, medical use of marijuana, um, and also maybe enforcement of. Uh, possession of marijuana with a very low level of enforcement, um, you know, not, um, not at the current level. So I guess on those two topics, and uh, well, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and start with uh, you, Mr. Romero-Martinez. I didn't you, I mean, I've lost track of how we're starting this. It is your turn to start, and this is, oh. I think it's your turn. It doesn't matter, I can start with it. Yeah. Please do. And then, and you know, um, and just those, those two, medical marijuana and the enforcement uh, priority priorities of um, for law enforcement I think it's like over 29 states like even though I'm following the issues this year has been kind of wimpy because I think the normal group is kind of slow motion on their activities but generally speaking everybody knows that for over the last 11 years I support medical cannabis I think not recreational I think medical and I've been there at the forefront I've spoken in town hall meetings from Rollins to Cheyenne and I was at like 98% of all the hearings at the legislature and went on record and supported it and while everybody was bickering. 
We need medical cannabis for a lot of reasons. People who are suffering from illness, pain, disease, should have a less toxic option to select from, i.e. organic and non-GMO forms of industrial hemp. This would help Wyoming farmers and allow human sustainability programs, both private and public, and we're already moving forward with the federal application through the legislature on hemp grows, and it's just a matter of time before medical marijuana take, you know, takes root here. And the majority of Republican senators, even six years ago when they allowed some trials, it wasn't because Wyoming is never going to happen here, people that utter that uh, c confused statement. It's because It was because of capacity. We were going to have to borrow from, from Colorado. That time they were having a shortage. It's a matter of talking to the right people who know how to farm, create double insulated plexiglass just like we have botanic gardens, and creating a product that's good and that doctors can prescribe. All right. Thank you. And do you want me to repeat, uh, repeat the question? Okay. I'm in strong support of medical marijuana. If you've ever had a family member or have known someone who has uh, suffered from cancer or from any other really debilitating disease where uh, medically prescribed marijuana could ease the suffering and the pain, uh, it, again, it's, it's the humane decision to do. As far as enforcement goes, um, I think that in, in um, or, or rather going back to like why we haven't passed this in the past, um, I know that Representative Blake had uh, medical marijuana or an oil bill um, that got further than it had before but still failed. So I think that there's a lot of education that needs to happen in Wyoming. Um, I think there's some fear about uh, un unleashing the, the, the cannabis gates. And um, I think we could do a better job of educating folks about what medical marijuana will bring to the state. And then the other piece that I want to um, say is that I think that we have a culture here that does support moderation. Um, and I think we, we have seen that um, folks in Wyoming, if you give us the opportunity to make good choices, if you give us the opportunity um, to uh, regulate our, ourselves, we're a pretty libertarian-minded state, and I think we can legalize cannabis fill our coffers with that money, and um, still do all right by each other as neighbors. Okay, all right. Do you have anything to add there, John? I do. Uh, you know, I just want to put a caution flag out to what I was talking about with medical marijuana, too, is that that doesn't mean, and I'm just being blunt here, that doesn't mean go out there and smoke a big fat doobie that's like 99 THC proof or whatever. This is to my friends and family that you know, would listen to that, you know, the, everyone uses the word doobie, that's just a big, you don't go out there and drink a whole thing of Everclear and expect to drive. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't expect to smoke a whole bunch of cannabis and be able to drive too. Okay. Uh, uh, and Ms. Burlingame, did you want to add anything or? About what I think about doobies? No, I think I'm going to pass. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And uh, so we're, we're coming to the end of the evening um, into your two minute closing. And um, just if uh, the just referring to the five principles that the league has uh, worked up and um, if you um, feel you want to weigh in to endorse or want to comment on these at all, this would be a time to do it. And for the then for the public, I'll just read those real quickly. There's just, they're five and they're very short. Candidates will defend the right of every qualified Wyoming voter to full and equal participation in the electoral process. Candidates will conduct honest and open campaigns, stating the sources of facts used in their campaigns. Candidates will stick to the campaign issues and statements, debates, advertisements, and news releases. They will not permit use of character defamation or other attacks on opponents' personal or family lives. Candidates will disavow assertions that misrepresent, distort, or otherwise falsify the facts. And finally, candidates will publicly reject actions by supporters that violate these principles. So again, you know, we're not asking uh, everyone for their commitment to it, but if you do want to weigh in on them, we'd appreciate that at this point. Meanwhile, you have two minutes to use as you wish to close. And uh, we'll start with, with Ms. Burlingame. Uh, yeah, I'm in full-throated support of these uh, principles for campaign integrity. I believe strongly in them. And unfortunately, in my conversations with many women around the state of Wyoming um, who I have spoken to about running for public office, this is one of the things that comes up the most. 
that uh, women have said, look, I saw what was done to Mary Throne when she ran. I, I've seen some really ugly um, personal attacks, and I don't know if I'm up for that. And I, I hope that there's the opportunity to say, we're accountable for our campaigns. Um, and uh, this sort of business of like, wink and nod, oh, it didn't come from me, it came from the state party, or it came from somebody else, I really find that unacceptable. Um, I stand by everything that will come out for my campaign, and um, I, I certainly um, find no value in um, campaigning in a really dirty, underhanded way. But I do hope to represent, I think, um, what is a groundswell of women in the state of Wyoming who have decided to throw our hats into the ring. I think it's an amazing time uh, to be a woman in Wyoming. And I think that there is an opportunity here when we look around at our legislature and say, how did we go from being one of the legislators who had some of the, the, the most representation from women to the dead bottom? And I, I want to support our, our, our women in the legislature who are already there, uh, women who I consider friends and, and mentors, um, like Representative Connolly, uh, like Senator Ellis, um, women who I think represent the state of Wyoming in a really powerful way. And I hope that my neighbors in the south side where I live, in downtown, where business owners like Renee Janelinik are revitalizing and making our community a place people want to stay. Um, and over to the West Edge, where Dave Tubner and Warehouse 21 um, are making Cheyenne a place that I hope that I can represent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Romero Martinez, you get the, the final word tonight. Thanks to League of Women Voters uh, for putting this deal on. I also want to say thanks to Christ Jesus for giving me the opportunity to still be alive today. Um, I just wanted to say that. I like point number two. Uh, I just want to read it again. Candidates will conduct honest and open campaigns stating the sources of facts used in their campaigns. And so I have this paper here. It's kind of crinkly and goes like this. And, I, and it's cut down the middle and it's bullet pointed. I was looking on the internet on ballots and how ballots used to be made and they used to be these long ballots. And, and so I kind of cloned that concept. And one of the things I have on here is religious freedom and religious liberty that uh, respecting our first and most important right and liberty and second civil right. Although religious freedom and liberty have been protected by the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights, groups from the far right and the far left have put many Catholics, Orthodox, and Jewish people facing discrimination based on religion, national origin, and race pretty much in a very difficult situation. The protected groups have been under fire, under fierce assault. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom states that Catholic Christians are, quote, the most persecuted group, end quote, in the entire world, contrary to propaganda media. Source, USCIRF.gov and www.ewtn.com. So I like that number two, and what I did on here was I did that, and then I put my source down there, and I do that for all my issues. I don't, is this new? But anyways, I'm really glad to see that, and of course I support all of them, and it's kind of nice to see that because when I was involved in my cousin Floyd Escobar's campaign when I was 16 years old, you saw that all the time, and now it's becoming less, and it makes the issues more central, because I think what voters really care about when it comes down to it, are the issues. Today we agreed on a couple of issues that some people think we might be just diametrically opposed on, and we're not. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, remind you everybody to vote uh, by, the, uh, by primary day, August 21st, and these two candidates will be um, uh, hoping to make it to the general election or will they represent their parties. And so thank you, if we can thank them. Thank you.